Matthew chapter 1. Well, uh, one of the movies that you could see on numerous channels at this time of the year, it's not my favorite Christmas movie. It's not It's a Wonderful Life. It's not Elf, you know, some of those absolutely inspirational films. But it, it, it's one of those movies that some people would call it a classic. Never want to miss it. And others would say, I despise that movie, right? Whatever. It's Christmas Vacation with the Griswold family, right? And uh, Chevy Chase. And in one of those early scenes in the movie, he's got the 100,000 light bulbs on his house. And they finally go on. Boom. Hallelujah. And it's this tremendous scene of fulfillment. And the song's being sung. And he turns to his father on the lawn. Dad, I'm so glad you could be here. And his dad says, it's a beaut, Clark. It's a beaut. And thanks, Dad. You taught me everything I know about exterior illumination. And he goes to his mom and his, yeah, mom and his kids and his wife and his, even his in-laws. I'm so glad you could share this moment. And then he goes and stands next to Cousin Ed. And he says, Ed? Eddie, like, and we, we, we see him kind of standing there in his kind of frumpy outfit, and there's their beat-up RV in the driveway, and his wife says he wanted to surprise you, and if there's one thing that's clear, as Clark Griswold just stands there and keeps going, Ed, cousin Ed, right, is that he was an unexpected participant in their Christmas. We're beginning a study today, which I have... Uh, been looking forward to in the Gospel of Matthew. It's going to take us well into 2018, maybe through it, who knows, on, on Sunday mornings. Uh, and I'm excited about the journey we're going to take being close friends with Jesus, right, and seeing it. But we are beginning initially and intentionally today. I waited for this Sunday because I want us to see that the birth of Jesus was not unexpected. Luke's gospel, well, he'll share with us some of the human sense, and Mary is like, wow, shocked and surprised, and the shepherds in the field are, wow, shocked and surprised, but Matthew is going to give us God's master plan. And contrary to Cousin Ed's unexpected appearance on the Griswold front lawn, if there is one person that Christmas told us is going to appear on the earth's lawn, it's Jesus. It is not unexpected. Christmas is the visible fulfillment of God's powerful plan. And so let's ask God to encourage us through his word today. Almighty God, I surrender any of my thoughts, O oh God, to your use today. My brain will only function as long as you allow it to. <laughs> and I ask you to speak in whatever way would exalt the truth of who you are revealed to be in your word. We need it, Lord. We've come in here today, some people riding a high and other people here as low as they've ever been. We need to hear from the living God. Speak to us through your word in the name of Jesus whom we've sung about, Emmanuel, God with us, amen. In Matthew chapter 1, we read in verse 1, the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I want us to begin today by seeing that there is a plan. There is a plan. In verse 2, we read, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Depending what translation you're reading, it may sound a little different, right? I'm reading from the New American Standard, but I'm reading from the current New American Standard. In 1977 and earlier, it was, it was worded just a bit different, right? So if you're holding a real early New American Standard, it would say, to Abraham was born Isaac. If you're reading from the King James or the New King James, it will say, Abraham begot Isaac. The fact is, whatever the translation may be, we all get the clear meaning. And what it's saying to us is that there is a plan that clearly is pointing to Jesus. This is not just a list of names. These are names that are connected and they form the lifeline to Jesus. 
of Nazareth. Luke chapter 3 records a genealogy of Jesus that's different. I believe it's the genealogy through the bloodline of Mary. Because remember, Jesus is not from Joseph's bloodline. It was an immaculate conception, right? He was miraculously conceived in Mary. And it was amazing, right? It was uh, this, this tremendous, miraculous birth. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary. So it's her bloodline, right? And, and Luke takes it back through all the way to, to Adam, not listing every person. But Matthew's giving us a different one, right? Matthew is giving us the royal line, the legal line of Joseph going back through David and ultimately to Abraham. You've been here a while, you know that I love three-point outlines. It's kind of me, right? People even say, I, I, PV, right? He's going to tell you a story. He's going to give you three points. He's going to try and pull it together at the end, hopefully successfully, right? But Matthew gives me encouragement because I realize God likes three-point outlines. Because if you look at verse 17, what does he have Matthew say at the end of it all? So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation of Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. So Matthew says, under the inspiration of God, there are three points right, to the, the plan of God the point is, all three of them point to one truth. There's one plan that God was working through generations that absolutely would not be stopped. John MacArthur shares, Matthew's intent is not to have the reader digress into a study of each person listed, but it is to show that all of those persons point to the royalty of Christ. What took centuries to unfold, as we read on, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram was the father of Abinadab. What took centuries to unfold is what was promised to Abraham, was promised to David in 2 Samuel 7, there will be one who will establish your throne forever, the kingdom of the eternal God. The Messiah, Jesus Christ. God laid out the master plan and Matthew's saying, look, he fulfilled it. If God had given us the plan and said, run with it, the plan would have been destroyed and blown up and ruined. It would be buried under centuries of ancient dust, right? Because look at the people that are in it. Abraham, verse 2, who did what? Who, because he was afraid, he lied about his wife twice to protect himself. Jacob's in there. Jacob, who did what? Because he wanted to get the blessing of being the firstborn ahead of his brother Esau, who really was, he deceived his father. His father said, are you Esau? Yes, I am. Oh, David, even David, a man after God's own heart, such a man of tremendous faith who slew Goliath, was also a man who allowed what? Tremendous moral failure into his life. Tremendous moral failure. Which led to what? It led to deceit. It led to, you know, just death. One of the things that in our culture that I want to shout forward today, you know, every day on the news we're hearing about moral failure, another congressman, moral failure, a Hollywood person, moral failure, a pastor, moral failure. And I want to shout out because w w the news is almost put out like they failed and they are to be cursed forever. That's not the message of the gospel. Absolutely. Face it. Be repentant. Confess it. Don't condone it. Don't cover it. But know this. There is forgiveness through the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Forgiveness that can break the chains of that guilt and set you on a new path. Every time I hear a new story, I want to write a letter to that person and say, listen, face up to what you did, but know this, that's why Christmas is here. Jesus came for that purpose. We look at these lives. Solomon, Solomon eventually who did what? Turned away from God and the kingdom was divided. And yet through it all, the royal line, as we read name after name, the royal line remained unbroken and it continued on. 
Why? Because God was sending a Savior who would accomplish what none of his ancestors could accomplish. He would perfectly, God in the flesh, take all of our sins to the cross and pay the price. God kept his plan. This Thanksgiving we had, again, our Thanksgiving football game. We had two of them, actually. We're over there in... Uh, are you, are you healed yet, by the way? Have you recovered, Brian, from the... <laughs> we had several bumps and bruises, but we, we uh, over there on Woodlawn, we had 34 guys or something split into two different fields, and some of these young guys, man, they got rocket arms. <laughs> Mine is, is opposite that, and so I have to throw it early so that it, the ball is actually there by the time the guy gets there, right? And so I, I was quarterback, and I, I said, let's huddle. No, we don't need a huddle. And I see a guy goes out, and I see he's got his, his the guy covered him, is kind of leaning that way, and the middle of the field's open. I throw it to the middle of the field, and he cuts out some. And I call, let's go, huddle up, huddle up. We are having a huddle. We don't need a huddle. I said, yes, we do, because here's the deal. Your plan doesn't matter. Only mine does, because I'll have the football. So if you plan to do it down and out, and I plan for you to do a post pattern, only my plan matters. I'm the one throwing the ball. Well, what, is, what does Matthew say? Huddle up. Hey, guys, I look at Matthew 1. Huddle up and listen. Only God's plan matters. Only his. He's the one, and it's sure. He is the constant. Pick a verse. I'll pick, I'll pick verse 14. And I'm going to read it the way, you know, I read it, right? During the life of Azor, God was the master of the universe and he was working his plan. During the life of Zadok, God was the master of the universe and he was working his plan. During the life of Achim, God was the master of the universe and he was working his plan. During the life of Iliud, God was the master of the universe and he's working his plan. He has no rival. He has no equal. Satan took a shot at it and miserably failed. And people ever since have. And there are people in our world today who are out there doing everything they can to intimidate you and tell you, look at my intelligence. I am looked at as the world as one of the most intelligent people. I can tell you God is a myth. And that person is someday going to breathe the last breath. And they will face Almighty God and realize he is no myth. Only his plan matters, but know this, it's sure. He laid out his plan. Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and it moves on. It is sure. We live in a world where what's happening? What's this? God is working his plan. No other plan is sure. No other plan is sure. I don't care how much money those people have that are sitting in the back room and saying, we're going to do this and do this and do this. I don't care how much power, uh, you know, some editorial board in a media room is saying, we're going to get shape this. Up. God is going to work his plan. And so know that. Because Christmas is the fulfillment of God's plan. There is a plan. There are also pieces to that plan, right? Sure there are there pieces. We, we just read, we read them all, right? Everyone mentioned by name, right? Matthew says, you may know Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Vixen, but do you know Uzziah and Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah? Because they are pieces in the plan, while they're all pointing to Jesus, this is where God's plan is going. He promised it to Abraham. I am going to build a nation through you, and I'm going to bless the entire world through your seed. There is one going to come from your line that will offer salvation to everybody. And God uses these lives. Each life is a part of his plan. Each life is a life that he wants to use. Uh, we may get to verse 13, and when we see there the name Zerubbabel, that's the last name that we know anything about as far as the Old Testament. The Old Testament tells us about a lot of these and names. Some of you may read the name and be like, oh, I know that story. And Zerubbabel's the last one. After that, 
Some of these other guys in here, we have no idea who they are, except that they're listed in here. Well, does that mean that all we get is, yeah, they were the father, of, and, and we move on? Like, they, they were discarded? God, God you know, it, it just didn't use them. I thank God for my wife because she very graciously allows me to share some of our habits and happenings that uh, put on display our, just, just that we're not, you know, picture perfect or whatever it may be, you know. And um, one of the funny things that happens, I'll say often, come home from church on a Sunday morning and uh, when I do, I go into our room and I chuckle because... I kind of then put together a timeline of what happened in that room. I, I leave early on Sunday mornings. I come to church much earlier, and I see she originally thought she was going to wear that, and she put that there, and this, and, and, and there may be three or four outfits there, right, that, that kind of pieces of this or that, and, and those were all ones that I could almost picture going, eh, eh, you know, like it, look at, and, and that's, I'm looking at the ones that just were not used. Is that what verse 15 is? Iliud, Eli, Eleazar? Are they outfits God just decided he didn't want to wear? Right? And they're, no. No, every one of them is meaningful, even though that's the only line they get. Iliud was the father of Eleazar. What we know to be true is what? That God is working through them. That God is dealing with them in a personal way. He wants to use them. Every one of us has a meaningful place as one of the pieces in God's plan. And that means so do you. Amazing how many people are like, well, not me. Yes, you. <laughs> yes, you. Right? It, 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 as, as a matter of fact, it's in the pieces that we see the beautiful display of God's grace. See, there is a plan and we see his power and sovereignty. Look what God is doing. In the pieces, we see his incredible grace. Look what he does with us messed up people. He uses us in his plan. And, and it's, it's amazing, right? You get to verse 3, for example. And we would read in there, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. You might say, who is Tamar? Huh? What, what have you heard about Tamar? What have you heard about Tamar? Right? We don't talk about her very much in our family. You, you learn the story of Tamar, and we're not going to turn there to uh, read it, but when you learn the story of Tamar and you realize what a story of personal pain, here is a woman who is married to Judah's first son and the line listed here is coming through Judah and that first son his life is taken by God because he's evil and the second son they lived in a different culture that we do it was understood in their mind that if if your older brother died and you were not married and his wife had no children now you had to marry her and carry the family line the second husband was evil and he died and Judah promised don't worry when my Youngest son gets old enough, I'll, he'll be your husband and go back and live with your family. And Tamar did, and she did what was the respectable thing to do. And, but Judah forgot all about her and had no intentions of giving her his third son. And so what did she do? She decided, well, then here's what I have to do. She dressed up as a prostitute. And she got in a position where he would notice her, and then he took her as a prostitute, and he went to be with her as a prostitute, and she got pregnant with what? Judah's child. And guess what? That's the child that the line goes through. See, that's the child that the line goes through. One of those children, well, yeah, we, we kind of just... Why don't I see her picture in the family album? Where is she? Well, we, you know. But God says, that's what this is all about. That's why Christ is coming. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right? The wages of sin is death. 
but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's why he's coming. God uses pieces like us, soiled and messy and broken, guilty and beat down. God includes that child, that's one of the children, in the line. There's Tamar's name. And you can't escape it. Because God cares personally about pieces, lives. Look at Ephesians, if you would. Ephesians chapter 2. I know many of you know uh, the, the verses 8 and 9. But it's great to, to finish off with verse 10. Because in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 we read, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. I want my life to be meaningful. You know, I want there to be meaning in my job, and I want there to be meaning in my relationship. And I went, do you? Because, listen, the master has a master plan. And part of his master plan is to use you in that job. Part of his master plan is to use you in that relationship to reflect his presence in your life. Our lives are filled with meaning. Does that thrill you? Thrill you with a sense of, all right, what do you got for me to do? Last week, uh, uh, grateful Dr. Chip Phillips was here to share with you. We got to go out and see our daughter Natalie in Pittsburgh, and one of the places she loves to go is Barnes and Noble. And we were in the bookstore there, and uh, you know, it's I, I, I you know, it, the, the place was packed. I'm in there, and every book I look at, I look at Amazon. I'm like, I can get it cheaper there, you know, kind of. And, and if you work there, I'm sorry, but like, you know, but but the place is packed and and terrific. I sat down and I'm reading a little book and it's this neat little well, short story about a family in the 1950s and it's, ah, it's, you know, maybe a decade before really what I, my life, but just this neat aspect and it's Christmas Eve and, and, and the, the older brother, he's now 11 and um, the, his two younger sisters have had to go off to bed now and he's downstairs on the sofa with his mom and, and uh, his mom is proud of him for the way he you know, because now that he's growing, you know, the way he kind of explains Santa to his younger sister. And his mom's kind of proud of him. And he says, she swallowed it hook, line, and sinker, mom. She says, you're a good big brother. And he says, ah, oh, anyone would do it. Now Davy was looking into the fire. You know, when Jill, that's his next sister, when she first asked me if Santa was really real, like she was afraid to ask you and wanted it to be a secret between just us. I didn't know what to say. Mother says, how'd you handle it, honey? Well, that's when I came up with the plan. I'm going to have an answer for every question she had. How does he make it to every house? Well, he goes super, super fast. There aren't as many houses as you think there are. What about a house with no chimney? Oh, he can use the oven or the furnace. Well, what about if the milk gets warm? Oh, when he touches the milk, it gets cold. And his mom whispers, that was such a smart idea, so quick. She says, you're going to have to do the same pretty soon for your youngest sister, Connie. And he says, of course, Mom, don't worry about it. It's my job now, right? You just picture, it's my job now, right? I'm ready. I'm ready to step in and take the mantle on my shoulders. Are you ready? Paul says to the Romans, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, Holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? You may prove that good, perfect, what will of God? What's his will? To use your life. It's our turn to respond to that. Does it thrill you with the fact that God's timeline has reached 2017 and it's our names that are now on there? I'm not part of the family line that brought the Christ, but I am part of his continued family line, the body of Christ. There is a plan. There are pieces. 
God wants to use us. Lastly, there is a limited perspective. You can read a lot of that in these different names in here. We don't have the time to look at every story, right? But you just look at verse 6. Jesse was the father of David, the king. And if you went back to 1 Samuel chapter 16, and you begin to read in 1 Samuel chapter 16, right, that the prophet comes to anoint the king. And Jesse is, okay, I... I'm stunned, you know, but, but all right, let me get my sons. And he brings them out. All of them, except the one that God has to be in the line of Jesus. And the prophet says, is this all of them? Because none of them did the Spirit of God tell me to anoint. I got, a, I got another one, but I, I don't know if you're seeing what I'm seeing. And he brings out David. That's the one. See, we have a problem with a limited perspective. We just do. We get to rejoice in his master plan. Praise God, I can see how he worked his plan to Christmas. And I can see how he used all their lives. But I can't see what he's doing with me right now. Just because we're part of the plan doesn't mean we're always going to see it clearly. I shared about Thanksgiving football, right? And um, about 20 years ago, we Thanksgiving, I think about 20 years ago, Natalie was maybe one and a half, two and a half, I'm not sure. She was like six here crawling on the floor with the, my brother Leo's dog, you know. But um, we were out to see my brother Leo in Wheaton, Illinois. Had Thanksgiving there. And we went out into the backyard to play football. Just, uh, you know. And, it, you know, my brother Leo, myself, a couple of his kids, Vince, you know, just in the backyard. And so Vince is on Uncle Leo's team. If any of you have ever played football with my brother Leo, you know that that's, like, I like to huddle, but I try and get in out of the huddle. Leo, you, you know, you, Leo's huddle sometimes can clearly delay of game because it's, it's he'll be there and he'll kind of line up. And, okay, look, here's what you're going to do. You're going to be going across here and you're, I'm going I'm to throw you the ball there. But, okay, once you catch it, hang on a second because, look, you're coming from over here and you're going pit, to pitch it back to him. Now, when he does, I want you to be over here going ahead of him. And you're gonna, and, and Leo's having one of those plays. And they come out in the line of scrimmage and I see Vince and he comes to the line of scrimmage and my brother Leo goes, hike! And Vince takes two steps and as he does, he yells, Uncle Leo, I don't really know what the play is. I couldn't really, I don't know really what it is. You know, he's just kind of running around, right? God, thank you that you are a God who has a plan, and I know you work a plan, and I know you're using my life, and I got no idea what you're doing. I don't know what you're telling me to do. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. How, I can't see it. And not only can I not see it sometimes, I don't like it, Right? Years ago, I, I couldn't find the sermon that I had, like, I couldn't find the poem. I remembered some of it. But years ago, in one of my sermons, I wrote my version of, I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam, I am, right? And I said, I do not like to suffer pain. I do not like it. Vince is my name. I do not like to skin my knee. I do not like the sting of a bee. I do not like to suffer pain. I do not like it. Vince is my name. I do not like to pedal uphill. I do not like an overdue bill. I do not like to suffer pain. I do not like it. Vince is my name. I do not like when cars don't start. I do not like pain in the heart. I do not like to hear my loved ones cry. I do not like to see my loved ones die. I do not like to suffer pain. I do not like it. Vince is my name. I know that's not exclusive to me. God, what are you doing? He's working his plan. He's working his plan. And he's using you in it. He is working his plan. He is working his plan. In Hebrews chapter 11, when we kind of read a little more details of Matthew 1. Matthew 1, the genealogy. And in Hebrews 11, we, it, it, it's back there before the book of James. Uh, but Hebrews chapter 11, we get a little more 
reminder of some of the things that happened with those names. And we read in Hebrews 11 and verse 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. God, I don't know the place. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So a couple weeks ago there is a very real place called heaven, and that's where we're headed. But there is a journey here on earth, and God has a plan, and God's working in our lives, and he wants us to say to him, I trust you, O master. There is a master plan because there is a master, and I trust you. And I surrender my life to you to use me. And I may not understand it. And I may not understand the twists and the turns because I recognize I have a limited perspective. kind of uh, felt good to be an Eagles fan this past week when Carson Wentz's wonderful season ended. And his very first tweet he put out, he said this, I know my God is a powerful one with a perfect plan. It is time to just lean into him and trust. And he put hashtag Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. His plan is a victorious plan. There's, he is not going to fail. Trust him. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, we come before you now. If there's anybody in this room who has never open their heart to you, I ask right in this, right now, in this pause, that they might turn to you and in their own, not out loud, but in their own heart and soul, cry out, oh God, I believe your plan is perfect. I believe you are the master. I believe your plan was for Jesus Christ to come be the savior of the world. I put all my faith in him today. Forgive me of my sin. Save me. Rescue me. Give me the gift of eternal life. Won't you pray that? Oh God, I trust you. I've been doubting you. I've been questioning you. I trust you. Lord, use my life. Remind me that there's meaning in everything, every day at work, every day with relationships, every day wherever I go, there's meaning. Father, we thank you. Your plan is perfect. You will use us as pieces. Our perspective may be limited. But we say to you, come and move in our lives. Come, thou long-expected Jesus. Have your way with us, we pray in your name. Amen.